This playthrough is rated T for teen. The pen is mightier than the sword, perhaps. Greetings and salutations, viewers. Von are back here with another episode of Sherlock Holmes vs. Jack the Ripper. In the last episode, we went through one of our leads and found out, though disturbing as it was, using cadavers for seances, they weren't part of the killings, or at least we have a pretty strong idea that they weren't. So now we gotta go to the the newspaper and kind of go through the Tom Bullings uh, path and see what goes from there. I must go to the Central News Agency. Well, goodbye then. <laughs> goodbye. Hope you I'll see you later. Anyway, all right, let's go to the news agency. Let's see, where are you? There it is. I must go to the Central News Agency. I'm at the press agency where bullying works. All right, let's see if we can check anything around here. Oh, there's a man. I would imagine these are compartments to organize the paper's incoming dispatches. Oops. Let's see if I need... A mirror. Ah. I can't even read that. The director. The fire has almost gone out, but the stove is still burning hot. Kind of reminds me of the mystery of the mummy for some reason, all of a sudden. I need more information. Okay, I thought... I was thinking, I was like, I wonder if that kicks you out if you uh, go that way, so... What do you want? It would be very informative to search Bulling's desk before meeting him, but first I must get rid of this bothersome person, perhaps by offering him a scoop. Hmm. What do you want? It would be very informative. Okay, okay, okay. Um... Uh, let's see... Let's see... Where's the... Let's give him this thing. Good evening. I'm looking for Tom Bulling, the journalist. He isn't here. He must be sleeping off somewhere. He gave me a tip. He wanted to save a scope for me. He always gets a good dirt. And yet when he comes in here, it's just to warm his behind. Look, he pulled his desk over the stove. Thanks for taking all that time to put over there, but yeah, we just have to show him the Rush Kalnikov uh, poster. Listen, Scoop, I'm bringing it over. Only if Bulling isn't here, I'm leaving. Wait, what's this Scoop? Bulling promised me a reward for info. There's a charlatan who does spiritualist seances that are a little bit special. He steals corpses from the morgue, puts makeup on them, dresses them up, and then uses them as puppets. I'll give you your juice. We'll pay you if this info is true. I'll write down the address of the hideout on the crook's leaflet, but the police will be in on this one, so you better get there in time. Understood. I'll go alone. Too bad for bullying. Hey, you wouldn't have a little something in advance. Look on bullying's desk. I know that he always leaves a few coins around for his snitches. Cheers. A Watson won't be pleased that I'm divulging the case, but I don't see any other way. Snitches get stitches? No, not quite. Not coin in this case, so... All right, bullying's test should be over here, but... Uh, permit me to defend myself against the slanderous accusations brought against me. You were not lied to regarding the facts. Mr. Bulling spends all of his time in the most uh, odious of pubs, but I am only doing my work as a journalist. It is during these uh, outings that I can find the best information because I am thus in contact with a common man. Let me prove to you, dear boss, that I can bring to this agency what it deserves. The most extraordinary and the most stimulating information. Four. Even handwriting, yet fairly recognizable. We don't even hear the whole thing. This is Bulling's desk, the one closest to the stove. These are Bulling's notes. They are of little interest at the moment, but one never knows. All right, well, we'll take them for now, I guess. So. A charred match. Did you have to burn something recently? Some coins. I will take them. That will avoid suspicion if the journalist returns. Yeah, because Sherlock has enough money from either his uh, being a consultationist to the police or Mycroft gives him money if it really comes down to it. Um, so, yeah, he's, he's, not, he's not a poor man. This may come in handy. A rag of some sort. So we got bullying notes, I owe you. I don't think that's on that. Yeah, we got an IOU, we got boys notes, money, and cloth. Oops. 
The fire has almost gone out, but the stove is still burning hot. Bulling recently used the stove. Yeah, okay. Let's see. I'm trying to think if there's anything else around here. I thought I grabbed everything. Hmm. Okay. Let's uh, see, we got the rags. Oh, I know. It's hot, so let's use the rags. A torn piece of blotting paper. Curious, curious. It looks like someone wanted to destroy this piece of blotting paper that had red ink on it. I can make out a few more letters, but backwards. I need something to help me. Oh, what do you read? What can you read backwards? Oh, I can check this. Mr. Moore, I've noticed that one of your employers, Thomas Bulling, arrived in the meeting in a state of inebriation. I must ask you to take care of your team's discipline. I know that you indulge this journalist, given the explosive information they manages to flesh out, but his this behavior is unacceptable. This should not repeat itself, or I will hold you personally responsible. The assistant director. Bulling's boss, Mr. Moore, seems to be protecting the journalist. For what reason? But anyway. A mirror. Yeah, to read it backwards, we need to use a mirror, so... By putting this piece of blotting paper in front of the mirror, I can read what is written. Alright, information on the Whitechapel killer. Call by telephone. W.A. Apparently, our journalist gets his information by telephone, too. Sadly, the name is almost erased. Alright, isn't there... Isn't there a phone? Yeah. If I telephone one of Bulling's contacts pretending to be his assistant, I might learn something of interest. Okay, so we just have to figure out what, uh, <clears throat> what the, who we actually need to call on that, but no Ghostbusters, so. Um, okay, so we got all the numbers, Fenton, Allgood, and Lavis, Lavis Heart, but we don't have Walsby's phone number. Uh, okay, so. Let's see, we got this stamp here. Well, it looks like it's this one right here. So it's got to be 1875 because we got the thing there. So let's do that. Walesby 1875, an ingenious way to save his contact. Central, Walesby 1875, if you will. Uh, thank you, I'll wait. Walesby, I am listening. Hello, my dear man. I'm calling on behalf of Tom Bulling. Bulling? So you know where this hypocrite, this liar, this... Not at all. He is currently unobtainable. In the meantime, he has left me with a note asking me to pursue his work, and he told me that you were aware... That's just great. I dropped everything off at his agency, but he didn't even bother to do the same for me. Tell me he at least gave you the information that I was asking in return. I am ready, sir. I am listening. Do the police have a suspect for the bizarre theft of cigarettes and carrots that took place at the Commercial Street Market? Okay, so basically we're supposed to use this information here to give a credible response to this guy. Um, so we got, when he comes from home from work, but for me, I, a silver servant, Scotland Yard, the head of the Tories line, he... Goes around in circles, is searching for a rabbit. He is never tired and makes a lot of noise. Will surely be gardener, ecologist, your best representative that coughs in secrecy, has already read the newspaper. So we need to put Scotland Yard is searching for a rabbit that it coughs. Is the I think according to Bulling that Inspector Lestrade's team is looking for a rabbit with a bad cough. Ah, oh, damned bullying. One day he'll be in some serious trouble for mocking the police. And now, can you tell me, with regards to the parliamentary scandal, what did the head of the Whig Party respond to the Tories who were treating him as a great incompetent? Uh, let's see, I think it's the same stuff. Yeah, it's already the same stuff. So this was a uh, vote, vote for me. I... Let's see, where is it? Will surely be... Your best representative. According to Bulling, the head of the Whigs said, Vote for me, I will be your best representative. Good. I'll make for a good paper. There is one last question. 
According to a government social study, civil servants make the best husbands. Why? Uh, see, when he, let's see, where is it? When he comes home from work, he is never tired and has already read the newspaper. I believe I can confirm that it is because civil servants aren't tired and have already read the paper when they come home from work. <laughs> Very true. Good. It seems like Bulling has finally done his work. As everything is all in order, can you now tell me where the information is that you sent to the agency? Yes. There is a large brown envelope near the dispatch cabinet. It's in there that we exchange our tips with Bulling. A thousand thanks. Goodbye, sir. My salutations to Bully. Alright, let's see. That should be over here, I believe. Yep. There are several documents in this file. Let's see. Alright. Uh, Spring Hill Jack. Uh, the Terror of London. Fantastical character. First appearance, 1837. Associated with several suspicious muggings and robberies taking place in London and the other parts of England. Description. A diabolical appearance. Bat swings, horns, blue flames coming out of the mouth and or eyes, etc. Identifying marks. All the eyewitnesses speak of his capacity to help leaps, make leaps of his superhuman distance where, where his nickname. Conclusion. Having become the very example of the urban legend of our century, this character fascinates as much by his demonic and fantastical aura as by the fact that he has never been caught by the police. Important. At the time of the attacks against the young women, Lucy Scales and Jane Aslop, the papers covering the event has recorded record sales for this week. That's why spring Jack is the reoccurring hero of a cheap fantasy publications and theater pieces. Popular and financial success guaranteed. Yeah, you're only putting all this stuff in because it's popular, not because it's true or whatever. Just like most media. I wonder why Bulling is studying this tale about spring Jack so meticulously. The Terror of London, spring Jack, The Phantom Killer, Butcher's Blade, The Whitechapel Butcher, Dr. Death, The London Ripper, The Bleeders, and The Bloody Reaper. All the all titles, I guess, are names for this guy. What does that mean? And then the telegram from Aberline. Mr. Charles Moore, I thank you for this testimony of the Whitechapel Killer that you followed. Not easy authentication. Do not hand over to the press without my invitation. Thank you for your collaboration and your discretion, and we won't forget this. Inspector Aberline. Well, well, a piece of information about the murders transmitted exclusively to the police without informing the press. That has piqued my curiosity. Uh, perhaps I should go to the police station to get more information. All right. Tom, about the letter. Given the thanks from Inspector Aberline, I think that they took the bait even though they were defending themselves. Think of the second. We must be ready if he kills again. Either way, we must keep up the correspondence. Correspondence. Be responsive. This idea will save us. We will get the information firsthand and we will make history. But stay quiet and keep a low profile. I am not really in the know. You will be the first one who gets it if there's trouble. See ya. What does that mean? I have inspected everything, but there's no sign of bullying. He must have dashed off to his HQ, the Wasp's Nest. However, before I go to see him, I should find out about this mysterious information. It could help me get something out of the journalist to the police station then. All right, time to teleport. Teleportation. Let's go to the police station. Come, come, back again, are we? Come this way, good man. The inspector has a few questions to ask you. Here is the man, inspector. Congratulations, Humphreys. So, my lad, one would say that you owe us a bit of an explanation for having left something with us. What is your full name and profession? Sherlock Holmes, consulting detective. Well, how about that? Mr. Holmes, can you explain this get-up? your presence in the neighbourhood despite my instructions, as well as this most opportune restitution of jewels? Firstly, I should tell you that not being under your command, I never understood what you said as an order, but rather as advice. I thought I would be wise to follow them to a certain extent. I intended to explain the stolen goods sooner or later. My presence here will allow me to fill you in on a few conclusions that... If it is in regard to the Whitechapel murders, it won't help us much. We have no doubt that we will be revealing the identity of the murderer to the people in the area in a day or two. I'm impressed, Inspector, and I offer you my sincerest congratulations. Nonetheless, you should investigate a certain doctor. Listen, Holmes, let us do our work. You've rid us of a great pain in the rear end by finding those jewels for us. It's weeks of work that you've saved us. 
but I think you're a little underqualified for a case like that of Jack the Ripper. Until it's over, I demand that you do not set foot in the area. Is that clear? I take note of your advice, Inspector. You mentioned Jack the Ripper. Pardon me, but you know the name of the murderer? Oh, it's from a letter that the Central News Agency sent our way. It was written by the killer. And even if it can't be proven, it must be recognised that the signature is striking. This information is confidential, and I would ask you to keep it to yourself, Holmes. Can I have a little look? Out of mere curiosity, Inspector, then I shall disappear. Hmm. In that case, I don't see any objection. Thank you so much. It's always weird how some of the subtitles are different from the actual dialogue. But anyway, September 25th, 1888, Share pa Patron. I keep on hearing the police have caught me, but they won't fix me in just yet. I will have laughed when they look so clever and talk about being on the night track. That joke about leather apron gave me a seal fit. I am down on whores, and I shan't quit ripping them till I do so buckled. Grand work the last job was. I gave the lady no time to squeal. How can they catch me now? I love my work and want to start again. You will soon hear of me with uh, my funny little games. I saved some of the proper red stuff in a, a ginger beer bottle over the last job to write with, and it went thick like glue, and I can't use it. Red ink is fit enough, I hope. <laughs> the next job I, sh I do, I shall clip the lady's ears off and send to the police officers. Just for jolly, wouldn't you? Keep this letter back till I do a bit more work. Then give it out straight. My knife's so nice and sharp, I want to get to work right away if I get a chance. Good luck. Yours truly, Jack the Ripper. Don't mind me giving the trade names. P.S. Want good enough to point this uh, before I got all the red ink off my hands because it no and no luck... Yet they uh, they may. I'm a doctor now. Ha <laughs> ha. I think that. Yeah, the actual Jack the Ripper note. Okay. Me? Not up to discovering who Jack the Ripper is? Well, we'll soon find out, won't we, Inspector Abilene? I know who wrote the dear boss letter signed Jack the Ripper that Inspector Abilene gave me. And above all, I now know why. This Tom Bulling was inspired by this fantastical character to build a myth out of the Whitechapel killer. Perhaps he would be receptive if I shared my discovery about him and prevent him from accusing Squibby. I must find him at once. My best bet would be to try my luck at the pub. Now, back to drinking again. Be a, be a weird, uh, uh, Shaw comes usually doesn't care about fame or fortune, but he does care about like figuring out the, the, uh, the, the scene, you know, the, the mystery or whatever. Even if, even if he does it first or whatever, he just wants to solve it. But yeah, sometimes he can get weirdly aggressive in some situations. It's kind of odd with Mr. Holmes. Ah, Holmes, I got your message and here I am. Oh, okay. I mean, what do you really add being here? And so, Holmes? Nah, he adds, he adds uh, enough for what it needs to be. It's just kind of funny, though. Perfect, Watson. That oaf Bluto is looking for us with evil intentions, and he may be hiding here. I will try to get more information inside. You, Watson, will be our lookout, and at the slightest suspicious sound, do not hesitate to call a constable on his rounds. All right, let's talk to Bullings again. Yes, sir. Okay, I didn't think he has anything to say. Hey, you wouldn't be the gas man that Bluto's looking for. Hmm. Don't know him. Yeah, even though I look exactly the same. Good evening, Mr. Bully. We know each other? No. However, I have some information that may be of interest to you. Talk, my friend. A pint for you if what you say is worth something. Does it have to do with the Whitechapel murders? Indeed. I know the identity of the man who wrote a letter to the police, a letter entitled Dear Boss, in which the author claims to be the Whitechapel murderer and is signed Jack the Ripper. What? It's a journalist who is inspired by spring Jack in order to strengthen the credibility and the seriousness of his agency. This new Jack will give him some first-hand information that he, in turn, will dole out sparingly to the authorities, as well as some carefully distilled indiscretions that the big papers will come to beg of him. He plays both sides off against one another and becomes the chief orchestrator of the rumor. He wrote this letter in this very spot and he has red ink on his fingers. Like you. What exactly are you after, my friend? 
You've been threatening a certain Squibby to distribute a telegram naming him as a possible suspect in these murders in revenge for an old feud. I would suggest you don't write this note and that you leave Squibby alone. I'd forgotten about the existence of that rapscallion. I threw that at him when I was visiting the station to get the dope. You should have seen his face. You must also stop sending these letters that waste the authorities' precious time. Right, well, I don't even know what you're talking about. I have a great relationship with the Bobbies. Just ask around. I don't have to answer to nobody. Now leave me alone. Yeah, what a, a guy falsifying evidence to make his paper more more fancy and your your name more credible. Ah, uh, that, that's so fantastical. It would never happen in real life. Farewell, sir. Good riddance. All right, so now we can deal with Squibby. Let's hurry to the police station, Watson. We are close to our goal. Squibby will be able to reveal what he knows about Tumblety. Squibby, so that's it. You're a free man again. We were just coming to the station to find you. Shh. Yeah, the Bobbies agreed to let me go, and I came to see Bluto before ferreting you out. So, you've seen the newspaper man? Yes, he is in the pub and everything is taken care of, but I'm waiting to hear what you have to say about Dr. Tumblety. Okay, but we have to be quick. One night, I goes to see Bluto in his hideout that ain't far from the boarding house where this Tumblety bloke has a room. I see him coming in too. He must have been on one real binge. To the point, the Tumblety fella was there and he smiles at me, all nice like. He tells me he's a great Yankee doctor, but my business interests him. I'm interested, I tell him, but I'm not the type to just jump right in without getting to know a person, see? He invites me around to his room to talk business, just him and me. We empty a bottle or two, and all of a sudden, like, he wants to show me what he's got in this big trunk that he always carts around places. I just about vomited, see? In these jars, just like pickles, you know, there were pieces of meat. And he whispers that it's the lady bits of some old dames. He called them pickybins. I'd call them love killers, I would. Yuck! After that, he starts to go on about rich folk. They ain't nothing but dogs, and I won't tell you the worst of it. Then he comes all close to me and puts his sweaty hand on my leg. He was one of them types. Not me. No, I don't wait a second before I give him a good thrashing, and I start running and let go of him, and he still wants to see me again just to talk business. But then... I had to do time, so business. Do you know where he can be found? Why, ain't he in his digs? Maybe he got to like it life behind bars too. I heard that in some jobs, there's a way to. Thank you for your information and we'll meet again, my friend. Here is the sum I promised to get you out of London. Ciao, fella. I've just got a little score to settle with Bluto and I'm heading for the country. My dear Watson, we must strike while the iron is hot. We have avoided meeting Dr. Tumblety until now. The time has come to do so. Do you have an opinion, Holmes? We must assure ourselves that the factor collector of female organs and a murderer who removes said organs are resident in the same area at the same time is nothing more than coincidence. Yeah. What are we doing, Holmes? I like how when we teleported, we just jumped, we fell out of the sky. <laughs> oh, this game's so buggy. I thought that you wouldn't bring me back your keys. It's... Oh, it's you, Mr. Holmes. Good evening, Dr. Watson. All right, what about these keys? Indeed, it is I again. One of your tenants left without returning his keys? Yes, it's Dr. Tumblety whom we spoke about. Shortly after your last visit here, some constables came and asked me a few questions regarding him. Barely had they left than the doctor came barreling around a street corner and rushed up into his room upstairs. A little while afterwards, while I was tidying, I heard a thud in his room and a rush down the stairs. He left with most of his bags, but without returning his keys. 
You can go up and see if you wish. The door is still open. Hmm. Yeah, we must have followed the coop. Careful, Watson. Do not walk around here until I've inspected these marks. I know, Holmes, I know. I understand your methods. Looks like real. What do you think, Holmes? It's real detective work. Ah, you have your rule and magnifying glass. I thought that you had forgotten them, Holmes. I never forget the essentials, my dear Watson. But where did you hide them, Holmes? That is a detective's secret. Right foot, light trails. The man was running. This isn't water. Going by its sticky texture and odor, I'd say we're dealing with formalin. Hmm. All right. Size 13. These are the footprints of a tall man who had recently stepped in formalin and who left this room in a hurry. Well, can I walk on it and enter the room now, Holmes? I, I guess. All right, let's see what's in here. What Tumble T left behind, if he left anything behind. Going by its size, this enormous trunk must be a wardrobe. These brackets are rather unusual. What do you think, Watson? Let's see, Holmes. These are the names of the battles from the American Civil War. Oh, uh, yeah, Sumter, Antietam, Chancellorville, Gaysburg, and Vicksburg. Yep, and the Appomattox Courthouse. Yep, I'm familiar with all these. We'll solve that here in a second, though. Sometimes it's interesting to look at all the pictures. London Bridge, I believe. Fruit. Flowers. Oh. There are a few pieces of a large glass jar in this puddle. The man who left the footprints on the ground must have walked in it while fleeing. Yeah. Left some of his work behind, it seems like. Dear Francis, it is impossible for us to meet again. I am feeling terrible, as pursuing our relationship further would put both my marriage and my reputation in danger. I must return to the life of love, fleeting and physical, is which a few coins to these young men assures corporal peace and anonymity. These growing feelings that I have for you make me scared, and I would prefer to shun this passion for the fear that it may never leave me. Perhaps we shall cross paths again one day in a discreet location where like-minded men meet. I know that you frequent them frequently, uh, regularly. You never hide yourself. For my part, I will spend more time with my wife and girls in order to find the serenity, and I hope to throw the veil of oblivion over our passionate embraces. All the best, Charles. My dear Francis, it is, it is in putting aside our common past and thus as a friend that I am sending you these words. I have learned that some mutual friends of your recent trouble with the law. You should be more careful. England has nothing in common with the Wild West, but our seedy areas can be just as dangerous. Your attraction to young rogues will cost you dearly one of these days, whether it be at the end of an alley or at the benches of a jury. A man of your quality and fortune does not have to frequent the hovels and bring his pistol with him everywhere. It is not necessary to use violence to find partners, unless his violence pleases you. Certain circles that we used to frequent still are still open to you. Take advantage of this healthy and respectable company rather than demeaning yourself with this destitute lad, these destitute lads and pray get rid of that god-awful chest. Who knows what the people to whom you show while bragging must think and speak of it. The man you once loved, Henry. This Dr. Tumblety seems to be attracted to men more than women. That much is clear. So, the doctor has a handgun and he would use it to restrain young men, perhaps. Yeah, I think I remember that also being... And a lot of this stuff is based off information that was gathered during the, the Jack the Ripper case. So a lot of this is based off real-life stuff. Or at least stuff that was discovered or at least perpetrated, you know, so... Do not understand how you found yourself in this situation. Your passionate discussions on the legitimacy of this war should have convinced me more than one. I still remember when you imitated him during that meeting. You struck that very characteristic pose and you exclaimed, Vicksburg is the key! The war can never be brought to a close until that key is in our pocket. We all applauded. I am sure that even Lincoln himself would have applauded. During these dark hours, it was rare to have the occasion to laugh. So many deaths, endings with our much-loved president, killed by this coward and left to join those of the victory at Gettysburg, who courageously fell so that the next day the key would be in our pocket. If this letter is addressed to him, it would appear our doctor is a veteran of the American Civil War. Vicksburg is the key. Now, now, that is interesting. Yeah, uh, Lincoln getting killed at the, the the theater by John Wilkes Booth, shot to the back of the head. The thing is, it could have been prevented, but just so many things happened at the same time that he was able to get past his security and just straight to the president. So. These footprints are the same as those found in front of the door. 
These footsteps must be those of Squibby. He must have hit Tumblety, who dropped one of his jars. And he ran out. Elementary, Holmes. Perfect, Watson. I don't think in the books uh, Watson ever says elementary. Holmes says elementary like once or twice. It's actually not that common. He says that in the short stories. Anyway. Going by its size, okay. this enormous... Let's actually click this uh, this time. So, All right, so Fort Sumter was in 61. I am under the impression that the dates written correspond to the battles, Holmes, but one is missing. Okay, so... Let's see. Five latches, each fitted with a six-number combination system. Okay, so Fort Sumter was in 61. I don't, I don't remember the exact day. I had to go by the dates I have here. Because it's been forever since I've studied the Civil War, so. So that's 12461. Antietam was in 62, so we're using the um, 17 one there, so. Oops. Oops. Dang it. 17. Oh, 09. And then 62. Whoops. And then Chancellorville was in 63. I think it was in February or March or something like that. But yeah. Like I said, I'm just using the, the times they have here for that stuff. And then Gettysburg was in 63 in March. Most people know that one. Uh, well, at least those who study Civil War history know generally when Gettysburg was. Because that's the most famous of the, of the fights, uh, battles in that one. And then Vicksburg was also in 63. Well, I mean, the Civil War was only so many years, so... But, yeah, this one was in uh, April. So, whoops. So we're using this number here. Uh, 63. So the one that's missing is the... Uh, um, let's see, I think... I think all this is... I need to move some stuff around because there's also symbols and stuff like here that we can move. Uh, so I want to move this to shield and I need to move this to uh, that. Yeah, that's how you figure out what the uh, combination is. You need to put in the date and then you need to change these symbols around. Uh, the hat's symbol, if it's uh, a Union or Confederacy and then soldiers and what what type of Units were involved in stuff like that. So let's see, that one was. I think that's the picture for that one. I think that one's like a B. Now these are hard to kind of guess, really. This is more of a just a, I won't say a guessing game, but trying to, because you'd actually have to know a bit about American history to figure these ones out off the top of your head. So, um, okay, so this one is, I think I just need to change the hat on this one. Yeah flag change the flag on that i don't recognize all the flags unfortunately off the top of my head uh some of them are basically militia flags uh, or banners or whatever so but i don't remember elementary this is dreadful holmes this trunk contains four jars in which organs are floating watson can you tell me at a glance what these organs are I would say that they are parts of female reproductive organs. Are these specimens fresh? No, and I am quite certain of it. From the colour and appearance, I'd say these organs have been in these jars for several months, if not years. Let's go to Baker Street. Is there someone here? Yes. What's going on, Finley? You seem to be in a panic. The two police officers wanted to know if someone suspicious had entered here. The Whitechapel killer has struck again, and if I understood correctly, he killed two women in the past few hours. Where? I don't know. The police didn't tell me anything. Quick, Holmes. We must catch up with them. Certainly not, Watson. Mr. Finley, do you know if the doctor had any other pieces of luggage up there apart from this trunk? One or two, I think. Do you take care of the doctor's laundry? My wife does laundry for the tenants once a week. The sheets, likewise. Would you be kind enough to let us know as soon as possible if the doctor shows up again? Certainly. I'm just worried that he won't be back, you see, and I'm annoyed about my keys. Holmes, I don't follow. The Whitechapel killer is, at this very moment, very close by, and we are just staying put, twiddling our thumbs. 
the Whitechapel killer has always been nearby. And what will we do? Go back to the scene of the crime or crimes and mix with the onlookers and trample the crime scenes even more? No, our time will come. Let's return to Baker Street. Let's go back to Baker Street. Home sweet home. We were less than 200 feet away from the first victim a few minutes before she was murdered. We might even have heard the murderer's voice. And we haven't done a thing for the past week. You're the one not doing anything, Watson. For my part, I had been working. And, as you know, I've made good use of this week by tracking down and verifying all of the solid facts on these two murders to write up the notes that are on my desk. Read them over again and try to gain a bit of perspective. The only bad thing about this game is that, um, you know, Sherlock Holmes may be able to, to, would be able to maybe solve the Jack the Ripper case a little bit sooner, possibly. But the thing is, the the overall murders still need to play out for that way we get all the clues from all the all the murders to solve the case. So you can't stop it early, you know, otherwise you won't get the full context of what the Jack the Ripper actually did. So, but anyway. Note, on the murder of the Liz Stride of Dutfield's yard, certain information that I have collected must must be verified. Liz Stride, nicknamed Long Liz, 45 years old, height 5'5", five, 5 five feet 5 inches, occasionally a pros occasional prostitute. She lived for the past three years in a stormy relationship with a certain kidney, a waterside laborer, 36 years of age, whom she left a few days earlier. She charged him with assault but failed to appear in court for the case was thrown out. The victim was discovered dead by one Louise Demschultz, at one o'clock in the morning on September 30th. The man's first thought was to verify it if his wife in the building next door was still alive before sounding the alarm. The two doctors who came at the police request to the scene of the crime in the moments after the discovery of the corpse put the time of death after 12.46 a.m. Cause of death, hemorrhage due to a throat injury. The weapon was a small knife with a large blunt edge. The verification of the statement is necessary. Could this wound have been caused by another tool? Neither the body nor the clothes were damaged, soiled, or disturbed by the killer. The right hand was open, stained with blood, and resting on the chest. The left hand was on the ground, partially closed, holding a, a packet of pastilles. The location of the discovery was a courtyard called Dutfield's Yard, whose door was led onto Burner Street in Whitechapel. The victim was found stretched out on the ground a few inches from, uh, from the formed the wall of one of the buildings served by this courtyard, the International Working Men's Club. This association, composed mainly of Jews originally from, originally from Russia and Poland, were organizing a conference that night on the subject. Why should Jews be socialists? presided by Mr. Morris Eagle. The, pro uh, the meeting ended around 11.30 p.m., but many members remained to debate and sing with the premises of the association. An American present that evening declared to have been in the courtyard at 12.20 a.m. and went to the street and didn't see anything unusual. He then returned back inside the club, but his estimation of time spent outside is approximately at best. Two witnesses were quoted by the press. Constable Smith, who was doing his rounds in the area on the night of the question, and a Hungarian by the name of Schwartz, who made a statement at the police station compared by an interpreter because he does not speak English. The transcription of these statements by the press should be treated with a caution. It would be advisable, if at all possible, to consult the exact content. Observe the clothing worn by the victim as well as her pos possessions at time of discovery of the body. Clothing, long black cloth jacket, fur trimmed around the bottom with a red rose and white maiden hair, fern pinned to it, black shirt, black crepe bonnet, Checked neck scarf knotted on the left side, dark brown velveteen bodice, two light serge petticoats, one white chemist, white stockings, spring sided boots, two handkerchiefs, one is noted to have fruit stains on them, a thimble, a piece of wool around a card, in the pocket in her undershirt, uh, a key, a small piece of lead pencil, six large, one small button, a comb, a broken piece of comb, a metal spoon, a hook, as from a dress, a piece of mus uh, muslin, one or two small pieces of paper. Note, on the murder of Catherine Eddowes, Catherine Eddowes, 46 years old, height 5, occasional prostitute. On, uh, ha she had a regular relationships for, relationship for seven years with one John Kelly, a man with no regular employment and about the same age as the victim. The victim was found dead at 1.44 a.m. on September 30th by P.C. Watkins, who was on his rounds. He secured the area by calling to the watchman of the warehouse located some feet from the crime scene. According to the doctor who arrived at the scene at 12.18 a.m., the victim had just been dead for a half hour. Unlikely, but we know for sure from experience how hard it is to precisely establish the time of death when the corpse has been very mistreated. Cause of death, hemorrhaging due to a throat wound. The medical examiner also confirmed that, it, that additionally, the extractions committed on the corpse were done post-mortem by a right-handed man possessing a long-bladed knife. 
The victim was subject to numerous mutilations. The victim was found stretched out in a dark corner of Mitri Square, notorious meeting for prostitutes and their clients because of its remote, poorly lit location. It should be noted that the victim was freed from the Bishopgate Street Police drunk tank at 1 o'clock in the morning. Mitri Square was visited at 1.30 a.m. by P.C. Watkins coming from Mitri Street and at 1.42 a.m. by P.C. Harvey coming from Church Passage. The two police constables didn't see anything suspicious in the area, but should be noted that P.C. Harvey didn't enter into Mitri Square, unlike P.C. Watkins. The watchman who came to lend a hand to Watkins at the time of the discovery of the body had been awoken during the time of the crime. His door is located a few feet from the spot where the victim was dying and didn't hear anything until the police's call. Firstly, we must note that the clothing worn by Catherine Eddowes was very char char characteristic. I think it's particularly the patterned green shint's skirt as well as the white men's vest. A few of her possessions included a thimble and were found around the corpse. The white apel apron was found on the corpse with a part missing, thus this missing part, previously resumed, thus ensuring authenticity, was found at 12.55 a.m. on the night of the murder by P.C. Alfred Long, who states that the object wasn't there at his preceding patrol at 2.20 a.m. The piece of bloody apron was found in the entrance hall leading to the stairs at 1808-119 Wentworth Model Dwellings on Goulston Street. At the night of the entrance, just above the apron, was found the following inscription in chalk. The Jews are not the men that will be blamed for nothing. The Jews are not the men that will be blamed for nothing. The Wentworth Model Dwelling Building, being almost exclusively occupied by Israelites in Coolston Street, being the site of very popular and much frequented market, he decided to erase the inscriptions before the day broke. Kate Eddowes belongings. Wearing at the time of her murder, black straw bonnet trimmed in green and black velvet with black beads, black strings, and worn tied to the head. Black cloth jacket trimmed around the collar and cuffs with an imitation fur and around the pockets in black steel braid and fur. Large metal buttons. Dark green skirt, three flounces, brown button on waistband. The skirt is patterned with uh, Michael Miss daisies and gold lilies. Man's white vest matching buttons down front. Brown Lindsay bodice, black velvet collar, and brown buttons down front. Gray stuffed petticoat with white waistband. Very old geezer alpaca shirt, worn in undergarment. Very old ragged blue skirt with red flounces. Light twill thing, worn as undergarments. While calico premise, pair of men's lace-up boots. Mohair faces, right boot repaired with red thread. One piece of red ga gauze, silkworm as a neckerchief. One large white pocket handkerchief. One large white cut cotton under... Uh, handkerchief with red and white bird eye borders, two unbleached calico pack pockets, tape strings, one blue stripe bed tickling pocket, brown ribbed uh, knee stockings darned with white cotton, possessions, two small bags, two short black clay pipes, one tin box containing tea, one tin box containing sugar, one tin matchbox, empty, 12 pieces white rag, one piece coarse linen, white, uh, one piece of blue and white shirting, three cornered, one piece red flannel with pins and needles, six pieces of soap, one small tooth comb, one white handle table knife, a metal spoon, a rather uh, cigarette case with white metal fittings, one hemp ball hemp, one piece of old white apron with repair, several buttons and a thimble, mustard tin containing two pawn tickets, one in the name of Emily Bar Barrel, 52, Wife's Row, dated August 31st, 9D for a man's flannel shirt. The other is in the name of Jane Kelly of 6 Dorset Street and dated September 21st, S 2S for a pair of men's boots. Both addresses are false. Printed handbill, portion of a pair of spectacles, one red mitten. I have read and reread them, but give me something to do then. A task where I can get stuck in, because. Find me a slaughterhouse that will give us exclusive use of its block for an hour. And find me, in your opinion, which common animal shares the most characteristics with humans from a physiological point of view? Uh, pig? I don't even know why I asked that question. Pray, find a dozen fresh pig's heads, Watson. Not big heads, I prefer small ones. Sows? That's it, Watson. As soon as you have done that, let me know. I request that you search in Whitechapel. Who knows, perhaps you will learn something about where Dr. Tumblety may be hiding. There is also no shortage of slaughterhouses and pig's heads in those parts. Yeah, a lot of people who do studies and like stuff that's similar to humans, they'll use pig's heads because of uh, like toughness and skin consistency, stuff like that. So you still haven't left, Watson? Ah, right, calm down, Holmes. Oh, Jeez. All right, well, anyway, let's, let's go to the brothel. Where are you? I was forgetting where the brothel is. There it is. What a ridiculous idea to have asked Holmes for something to do. 
Where on earth am I going to find what he wants? Perhaps that kind Lucy will be able to help me. If you have the means, I can let you pass before everyone. But behind me! <laughs> uh, very funny, man. Out of the way, I don't like the look of you. Alright, Mr. Fake Boyfriend. Good evening, Lucy. But is something wrong? Good evening, Dr. Watson. Yes, it's my uncle. He's no longer with us. Please accept my condolences, miss. Thank you, Doctor. But why are you here? Can I help you? Well, gotta find pigheads. Lovely, lovely pigheads. Pigheads, pigheads, eat them up, yum. My request may sound rather strange, but do you know if there is a butcher's or slaughterhouse in the area where pigs are killed? Uh, yes, Fletcher's the man. He was a regular client, owner of a little butcher's shop not far. But Miss Bella didn't want him to come, as long as he didn't treat his awful sickness. Can you point to his shop on my map? Certainly. Yep, thank you, so you don't have to walk there. Do you know anything about the two latest murders? Oh, goodness me, no. All the girls in the neighborhood are terrified. Who will be next? That's what everyone is asking. You think everyone would just stop doing prostitution work for a while, but unfortunately these ladies will need to make a living somehow. Goodbye, we'll see. Until next time, perhaps, Doctor. How about you? I have nothing to ask. Okay, okay, fine. All right, now we should have a... Let's see, where are you now? It should be the butcher shop. Ah, there's Fletcher's butcher shop. Closed due to illness. If the proprietor is ill, the butcher's block is probably not being used. Perhaps I can use it. Now, where could a sick butcher have got to? Well, the clinic, right? So. Yes, if Fletcher is ill, he should be here. Let's see if he's in here. Yes, if Fletcher is. Side to the dock. Good evening, Doctor Watson. Good evening, Doctor Gibbons. I have come to see you because I was wondering if, by any chance, you happen to have a patient by the name of Fletcher, a butcher who would have relinquished his shop due to illness. An illness caught during nocturnal encounters, if you catch my drift. Fletcher is one of the regulars at the clinic. Mercury treatment against syphilis. A night with Venus, a lifetime with Mercury. He left London a fortnight ago for the fresh country air. Why is he of interest to you? Oh, no reason. I'm more interested in using his shop, only for an hour or so. Would he have left his keys with family in the area? He has none left, but he must have left Hardiman, the cat's meat seller, to oversee his shop. They're in business. They're good friends. Do you know where he can be found? No, but wander around the neighbourhood and listen for his beep beeps. He often passes in front of the clinic. Besides, B besides, I don't know anything more, Doctor. I'm sorry. But you'd, you'd stop with a uh, inflection. Now, very big Danny. Well, clearly the game was when we talk to her again. Well, she's not. She's not hard to miss. Sorry, the scratch. Uh, cat wounds. It's me that you're looking for, sweetheart. Yeah, how's the cat wounds, huh, lady? Um, actually, no. I am looking for the cat food seller, Hardiman. Hardiman? Poor Hardiman. It isn't quitting time for him yet. That gives me some time to wander the streets before he shows up and with him all the cats hereabouts. Yeah, you don't like cats, do you, lady? I wonder why. Do you know where he lives? Sure. And for a copper, I might even tell you. Here are a few coins. You're too kind, Governor. Well, these days I knows that he lives with his mammy on Hanbury Street, in the same place where Dark Annie bled to death. Oh. Why did you call him poor Hardiman? Bah! He's in grieving, of course. Just a few weeks ago he lost his wife, and three months before that his girl, poor fella. He was in tatters. Even came to cry on my shoulder, believe it or not. Yeah, who would do that? Well, I must leave you. I must go to Hanbury Street. Uh, Hanbury Street, huh? Okay. 
This is the building in which poor Annie Chapman was killed. Baby! There's like nothing here. So, yeah, it's an isolated area, so. Beep, beep. Hello, are you Mr. Hardiman? That's me. Well, tell me the, tell me the skinny. I am Dr. Watson. I have come to see you about Fletcher's shop. I would like to use it for an hour or two, if you have the keys and your rates are reasonable. Do you want to operate on someone in the butchers? Not at all. One of my friends needs it to prepare pig's heads. Well, why not? Fletcher certainly wouldn't mind, but there's a problem. Uh, of course there's a problem. A problem? How so? This morning, the neighbour above broke his key in the door. The old boy must have already had a drink. So? Well, I tried my best to unjam it with Fletcher's spare key, which is pretty thin, and bam! That one broke too. Hard luck. But if you have the end of the broken key, perhaps it can be fixed. It must still be upstairs. I didn't pick it up. Fletcher has a key too, so I didn't think it was a problem. Fancy, if I just had another key with a simpler blade, I could copy it. I'm great at odd jobs. Fine, I will try to find all of that. Well, good thing, good thing keys were so easy to make back then. Well, see you later then. Goodbye, sir. All right, so now we need to find the uh, shop where... Did this guy say anything? I have nothing to ask. Okay, I think so. Tell me, is it... Are you coming, dearie? No, I'm not coming. Not coming at all. I have no reason to go that way. I was just saying if there's anything else to... I like how NPCs just randomly like... Wait, there's cat meat right there! Why do we have to... Why do we have to go to... Oh well, yeah, we're back here again. We're, we were with uh, Sherlock Holmes a couple of days ago, I think. We may have to go upstairs, but see him. This key was left inadvertently. Indeed, there is nothing terribly precious inside. But what a stench! What a... Oh, how dreadful. Uh, of course we're going to find something nasty here. Kebabs. The same as Hardiman's. So he prepares his meat here. Ugh. My word. These are innards. Yeah, so green as people. People! This bag contains butcher's equipment. Oh, dear. I found it. Oh, joy. Curiouser and curiouser. Yep, nothing right here. Have you found everything I need to remake the key? There you go. I think you'll manage with all of this. I'm sure I will, sir. It won't take me long. Say, I think there's some of your business upstairs. Oh, you're right. I ain't had the time to sort it out. Sometimes I'm in such a hurry to prepare my meat that I forget to clean up. But why do it in the stairwell? Awful bleeds bucket loads, they do, as you've seen. Now, why would I do that in my own lodgings? Ah, of course. But what about your poor neighbours? They owe it to me all the times I've helped them out. And I don't have a shop either. Uh-huh. Say, you sell animal meat, isn't that right? Would you know where I could find a dozen small pig's heads? The guy who gets me my offal should have some. I'll pay your day's wages if you meet me at Fletcher's butcher shop in two hours with the pig's heads. Here's a little advance. I'll do my best, Doctor. All right. The caretaker of another building told us that the place where your mother lives has a reputation for facilitating prostitutes' activities. Is that true? Sure, the doors are never closed. They come through here like it's Paddington Station. By the way, I heard about your loss. My condolences. Ta, sir. I saw them die slow deaths. 
My little girl, her face was eaten by the disease. <laughs> Thank you, my friend, and please forgive me for bringing up such painful memories. <laughs> Go, I must do my rounds, and I will look for what you've asked for. As for me, I will go and find Holmes, and we will go to the butchers together. Let's return to Fletcher's butcher shop. Your heads are on the block inside. Say, you wouldn't be the same chap who bought my whole load the other day. It's possible, but if you want to continue to do business together, you mustn't speak of my presence in the area to anyone. Don't worry, my lord. I'll be as quiet as a church mouse. Back to, back to Sherlock Holmes, so. Whitechapel Street. Holmes, will you explain the reason and rhyme behind this masquerade? Elementary, we shall conduct an experiment that will allow us to answer a simple question. Does the type of weapon used by the killer correspond to a specific profession? Try to find out if he's a butcher or a doctor or whatever. Yeah, this is definitely something out of a horror game, that's for sure. And here are our sow's heads. Congratulations, Watson. You're welcome, Holmes, but what do you really want to do? Take up a collection? Yeah, uh, that's been... he's been... Holmes has been known to do stranger things, so why not? Yeah, this is all common, but yeah, this definitely screams like horror. There is nothing further to find in this room, Watson. However, I need some knives. Our only hope is behind this door. I need something. All right, he said knife, right? So, although technically I can just use the mouse wheel to scroll up. I need something. There is nothing further to find in this room, Watson. However, I need some knives. Our only hope is behind this door. Let's see, there it is. There, this door is slightly raised. This wheel is broken and prevents the door from sliding. I need something. Yeah, just gonna put the new wheel on there. Elementary. While I prepare our experiment, could you find me two knives? A small one, somewhat larger than a pocket knife, with a large, sharp blade. We'll need it to separate the bones and to cut through the thick skins. Then find me a long knife that's at least 13 inches long, no shorter, that's sharp and has a thick blade. Fine, Holmes, but I'd like to tell you about Hardiman. Do you know that he prepares his kebabs himself and... That he owns butcher's tools and uses offal? That's obvious, Watson. Pray, take my magnifying glass and my rule and get started, Watson. Find me these two knives. Of course Sherlock Holmes already knows what we know. That's just how, the, how it is in the books, too, for the most part. Usually, most times, it's usually Watson, like, reaffirming Sherlock's knowledge is uh, usually the point of Watson, or for the reader to get a sense of what Sherlock is. I am in need of something. There we go. Well, I knew that, but I was just trying to see if he had anything else so we could interact with. No, I guess not. Okay. All right, time to find our knives. So basically the two knives we want are this one and this one, but we have to magnify them. Thanks to the magnifying glass, I can find a small knife that matches Holmes's description. Hmm, large size, fragments of cartilage. Fragments of cartilage. Hmm, large size, fragments of cartilage. Fragments of cartilage. Okay, Fragments wait. of cartilage. With the rule, I must find a large knife. Size, 13 inches. So these are the two we want, so... Here are the knives you asked for. Be careful, they're awfully sharp. Holmes... I must say that this experiment is making me rather uneasy, comparing animal heads to these poor women. 
You're right, Watson, but this somewhat shocking experiment may help to end this massacre and save other victims, you can be sure of that. Look, these pig's heads are still bloody, which will suit our experiment perfectly. I have a pocket knife and a scalpel with me. With the two knives you just brought me, we have a similar array of weapons as those probably used by the killer. We saw three types of throat wounds on the deceased attributed to this man, those intended to slit the throat, those intended to decapitate, and the more superficial yet mortal wound that led to the death of the unfortunate victim in Dutfield's yard, Miss Stride. With the help of these four knives, we are going to try to recreate these wounds on the pig's heads and see what we can establish about the weapon or weapons used. We may also be able to rule out Miss Stride as a victim of the killer of the other three. Alright, time to do some slicing, huh? Okay, so we basically just need to use these knives to... Um Let's try to use these weapons on this head to obtain a large deep wound to the throat, like those that were noted on three of the four victims. This little knife is very sharp and has a very wide blade. This pocket knife is very sharp, but its blade is too thin. Yeah, it doesn't have to be exact, you just have to cut into him. The wound is too shallow. Look, Watson, this knife easily penetrates the flesh. So we need to do the first one. Elementary. All right, let's uh, back up. All right, now I'll do the second, second one. So let's try to decapitate our victim with these tools, knowing that the killer didn't quite manage to do it. Charming. <laughs> Lovely. Look, Watson, this little knife with a wide base can easily slice the vertebrae of our porcine friend. The blade of this pocket knife is too thin to reach the vertebrae. With a scalpel, the wound is too shallow. This knife with a long blade easily slices the flesh, but cannot dislocate the vertebrae. Okay, we need to mark these three for that. Elementary. All right. Uh, if you say elementary, it means you did it right, by the way. So. Let's see if these knives can inflict a mortal wound in a situation where a single quick blow is given. The scenario in question is that of Dutfield's yard. Look, Watson, the blade sinks easily into the flesh. In using the cutting edge of this pocket knife blade, I can scrape the skin. This particularly sharp blade can make a deep gash with one quick slice. It cuts through the flesh easily as the blade is so sharp. All right, so one, three, and four. Elementary. Okay, so now we have to decide uh, which knife works best out of all of them, which is this one. Because you can see that's been marked three times. So. That's it, Watson. The big knife. With respect to the opinion of the medical examiners who noted that a butcher's knife with a long blade would have caused the eviscerations on some of the victims, we can assume, Watson, that he only used this type of weapon as it is capable of inflicting all of the wounds displayed. Furthermore, the Dutfield's Yard murder remains attributable, for the moment, to the Whitechapel killer, if we are able to explain why the murderer used his knife in a different manner. Why not go there now? We will try to reenact the killer's actions that night. Our first objective will be to clarify, one way or another, the statements of Constable Smith as well as this Hungarian by the name of Schwartz. We must also try to find out more about the International Working Men's Educational Club, underneath which the murder took place, perhaps at the Wasp's Nest. Yes, let's go to Dutfield's Yard or wherever, but quickly. I am in urgent need of fresh air. Let's go to the Wasp's Nest. I've actually done some stuff with uh, pig's heads when I was in school, and yeah, the, the, the smell can get to you pretty pretty quickly, so. Well, if you're not used to it anyway, so. All right, let's go back to Whitechapel and the pub. 
Don't forget that Bluto may still be hiding here. I will try to find out more inside. You, Watson, must intercept the policeman on his rounds. Given the hour and a bit of luck, it will be Smith. Try to get some information from him. Understood, Holmes. All right, so we've uh, we've been deducing so far, and unfortunately, multiple murders have occurred. But we're getting ever closer to our to our situation here. But we can't stop now, so we must interrogate these fellows and uh, get more on track to hopefully get more of a timeline to figure out where the game goes from there, and if we could stop any more murders from occurring. What will happen? Find out next time in the next episode of Sherlock Holmes versus Jack the Ripper. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you next time.